Hello guys. A very good evening. Hope I'm audible and visible. If so, say me hi. So it's been quite some time we discussed for case of pathology postgraduates, and today is one discussion where we can uh, see a couple of cases and wait for some of you guys to join so that we can make this a uh, little bit more interactive. Okay, so as I said that this will be a discussion for postgraduates. If you're an undergraduate and you come here, and it's completely fine. Uh, let's learn something new together. Fine. First, a few things. Uh, there is an offer going on at an academy for Neat PG. Uh, you'll get an extra three and six months subscription on six and uh, twelve months and above subscription respectively. If you're an aspirant preparing for Neat PG 2023, there are a few batches for you. You can enroll to whatever batch you like and wish to. Fine. So I said that this is going to be primarily for postgraduates. And I hope for aspiring postgraduates or in your first year or in your final year, or if you're a consultant, let's come and learn together something new, right? So what I'm going to have is I'm going to, I think I can cover three or four cases. Hello, Shana, good evening. Uh, so I'll display uh, an image, a case first. Uh, Jay, hi, I'm good. How, how are you? Good evening as well. And then there'll be a couple of uh, slides of that image. I want you to make a presumptive diagnosis. Try to describe the slide whatever I put because description is very very important for a pathology postgraduate. I am sure by this time you would have known that. Then we'll re-describe it by looking revisiting the images. We'll learn, we'll unlearn, and we'll relearn, right? And hopefully we can conclude something which will be useful for you. Uh, apply that in your real life scenario and to diagnose many more interesting cases, right? So this case one, uh, sorry for the mistake. This 12 year old uh, kid with a TPL lesion, right? So before even looking at the image. Tell me what all could be the possible differential diagnosis because if you want to be a good pathologist you should be an at least an average clinician because unless and until you can differentiate or keep the most common differential diagnosis in your mind you might miss out few things uh, in the microscope fine so what all could be the differential diagnosis of a 12 year old kid with a tpl lesion anything is comes to mind perfect perfect so the first thing i'm going to think of is osteosarcoma right Osteogenic sarcoma or an osteosarcoma is one of the important thing for me for that. Uh, GCT, I'll keep it a little bit down the road because what is the average age group of giant cell tumor? Giant cell tumor is not something which is very common in a 12 year old, right? In perfect like it. So, Ewing sarcoma, definitely one of the other thing as well. Maybe I'll keep second is differential diagnosis on Ewing sarcoma. Anything else which comes to your mind? Uh, the thing is, Totally based on my uh, differential uh, clinical scenario. ABC, just still a possibility, right? Aneurysmal bone cyst, I can keep. Can it be in cortical, uh, simple fibros fibrocortical defect or a simple bone cyst? Yes, and Shane, Ewing sarcoma is definitely a possibility. Can be a simple bone cyst, it could be, right? It could be just a simple bone cyst or it could be in fibrocortical defect, right? I have not mentioned whether it's from epiphysis, metaphysis, or diaphysis. If that is not mentioned, is there a possibility that this could be, let's say, a leukemia or a lymphoma metastasis? Is it possible to have that in 12 year old kid with a TPL lesion? Still possible, right? It could be a fibrous dysplasia, who knows? It could be mets from a lymphoma, leukemia, anything of that sort, right? So, perfect. You should have a at least a playground, okay? These are the things I'm going to look for. If I don't have these findings in the microscopy, then let's see what else is in the di diagnosis, right? So once you have a presumptive diagnosis, and if you're going to be a pathologist here, I again, I want you to know the salient feature. Like if I say Ewing sarcoma, what do you expect in a light, light microscopy? Leave IHC, leave uh, your special stains. Light microscopy, Ewing sarcoma, what I look for? One, one word, that's enough. One word or one pattern, that's enough. I have to look for small round blue cells, right? So you have to look for small round blue cells with molding and everything, the nuclear, the chromatin, everything nature is there, right? First thing I want to look for some modern blue cells. Make a presumptive statement in the mind, what you're looking for. Because if you don't know what you want, I won't be able to pick it up, fine? Okay, great. Aneurysmal bone cyst. I need an um, hemorrhagic area. Uh, it will have giant cells surrounding the hemorrhagic area. That's a classical finding. Simple bone cyst or a fibrocortical defect will have only fibrous tissue, might have scattered giant cells, nothing much, no uh, hemorrhage, no cystic area as much, fine. Fibrous dyspatia, I'm sure from your undergraduate time, you, might, you have been reading one finding in fibrous dyspatia, what is that? Yes, Savita, Rosette is also a finding seen in your Ewing sarcoma. You must have definitely heard about your tiny little pattern appearance, right? Yeah, Vedanti, 
uh, blood filled spaces for aving sarcoma, uh, sorry, and aneurysmal bones is definitely a differential diagnosis, right? And osteosarcoma. What do you look for in osteosarcoma? I look for a few things in osteosarcoma. What is that? Your malignant osteoid formation, right? When do you call something as a malignant osteoid formation? In case of osteosarcoma, when do you call anything as a malignant osteoid formation? It's not just the osteoid, which is, I'll call something as malignant osteoid when it is not rimmed by osteoblast, right? Perfect. I should see osteoid, which is malignant, which means it should not have a clear cut osteoblastic rimming. Then I'm definitely going to call it a malignant osteoid. Apart from that, the pleomorphism, mitosis, everything will complement to the diagnosis, right? Okay. Now I have set the place. Any case you're going to see, which will be not the conventional, like for a uterus, endometrial curating, I will not ask these differential diagnoses. It's simple and straightforward. But for few tumors, which are not so common, bone biopsy is not that common when you come outside. I won't have a presumptive diagnosis. Just one line word of what you want to see. Just let it run through your head, then look into the microscope, fine. Okay, low power. Describe this image. And maybe a little bit blurred. I think uh, the higher power will make it much better. What do you see in this image? I want you to just comment on this slide. Whatever comes to your mind, you can comment. We'll start with the simple thing. Is that a biopsy from the bone or is it something else totally? Because when, I, when I'm diving into something new, let me confirm the organ first. Is that a biopsy from the bone or not? It's a very, very simple question. I'm sure most of you kids can definitely answer that, right? Is it a biopsy from the bone? Uh, yes, right. So that that's that's more than enough for me, right? Thank you for that, right? So I do have bony trabeclia. I do have lots of bony trabeclia. So definitely the biopsy is not work, right? So now when you have an image like this, I want you to describe. See, as I said, it's a very low power image. You cannot see the cells. You can't see anything. The only thing in an extremely low power image is you can comment on the cellularity. Do you think the cellularity is more or less? That's a simple thing I want uh, the answer from. Great. I'll go with whatever Adil said. Adil has commented on there are some fibrous areas. Yes, definitely there are fibrous areas. Do you see a bone marrow space here? Is there any normal bone marrow space in this biopsy? Great. There's more cellularity. I do accept Sujana. There's definitely more cellularity. There are fibrous areas. I do see few broken here and there bony trabeclae. There are quite a few of them here as well, right? I do see bony trabeclae. Do you see bone marrow spaces? I don't see a proper bone marrow space, right? It's kind of filled with something else. I don't know what it is. It could be a tumor. It could be a reactive condition. It could be anything, right? Okay, let's go to a higher power. Okay, these are the concentrated area of the trabecular region, right? Now comment on this. Look at this and tell me whatever crosses your mind. I just want to be as open as possible. It's completely fine if you make a mistake. You're just going to learn together. Comment on whatever comes to mind. When you have a bone, keep a checklist. I want you to comment on the bony trabeclae, whether it's looking malignant or not. That's one. Second, I want you to comment on the osteoblast, osteoclast, osteocytes. I want you to comment on the in intervening stroma, whether it's normal fibrostroma or is a malignant stroma. I want you to comment on any other foreign cells. When I mean foreign cells, any metastatic cell or any lymphoma cells. Fine. Shakdeep, my 20 figures are seen. Uh, there's a brave finding at this power. Great. Uh, it's a bit difficult to identify my 20 figures in this power. But yes, if you have picked it up, great. Uh, we'll see in the future uh, next uh, image whether the my 20 figures, what you noticed, is real or not. One thing Adil has gone and commented, say forward, saying is benign. What made you comment it is benign, Adil? I kind of accept it's benign. What made you comment it's benign? Let's take one trabeclay for an example. Okay, let's let's take let's take this trabeclay. I'm a little bit zooming, so it might get a little bit blurred. Apologies for that. Let's identify this trabeclay alone. If you look at this trabeclay, can I say surrounding this bony trabeclay, are you seeing osteoblast rim? Are you seeing osteoblast surrounding this bony trabeclay? Is there osteo are they osteoblasts? They are right. I can see a little bit of osteoblast surrounding them. Right? There are definitely osteoblasts there. Is there osteoclast as well? osteoclast as well right perfect i do have osteoclast i do have osteoblast and i do have a little bit of osteocytes as well right 
So when you have a bony trabeculate with osteoblast, osteoclast, and osteocytes, it's unlikely to be a bone forming malignant lesion. Second thing, like what Adil said is, I have two things whenever it comes to bone. One is the osteogenic lesion. The other one is the fibrous lesion or the cartilage lesion. I obviously don't see any cartilage here, right? Let's look at this area. Let's look at this area. When you look at this area, it's predominantly the fibrous background, right? Uh, can I say that, whatever like Adil commented, can I call these a bland nuclei? Is it right to call them a bland nuclei? Or do you see pleomorphism of any sort in the marked slug size? Is there any pleomorphism or can I directly write it off as a bland nuclei? I want you guys to comment. There are quite a few of you live. It's okay if you make a mistake. I will never remember your name again. So it's fine to make a mistake, but please do comment. Is it bland? Is it pleomorphic? Every mistake you make here is going to help you to make a, a correct diagnosis in your real life. Okay, I would comment it as bland nuclei, right? Because uh, it's a spindle shaped cell. It's elongated. It's flat. It's not even plumb. Pleomorphism, I don't see it much. Uh, these cells, Actually, they are kind of compressed giant cells. So do not comment looking at these cells as fibroblasts. These are the osteoclast giant cells, which are a little bit looking plump in size. But the rest of the cells, which are mostly plant, right? Okay, great. Let's go to another higher power. This must be a 20x image. Let's go to the 40x. What are I seeing here? Again, this is from the area which didn't have the traffic clay, right? The other area. I'll just go up. This was from this area, the first image. The second image may be most likely from this area, fine. Less pleomorphism because NC ratio looks normal. Very good, something. Something, fine. Okay, very good. Okay, now comment on this image. Comment on whatever you're seeing. I want each and every part to be commented upon. Let's, I'll leave you how to comment on that, fine. First, are you seeing only fibrous area or fibrous plus bony area? I just say what, I'll give you options. You choose amongst them. That's more than enough for me. Is it only fibrous or fibrous plus bony? I want you guys just to open up. It's completely fine if you make a mistake. It's only fibrous, right? Okay, I'll tell it's only fibrous, fine. Now let me look at the fibroblast per se. Let's, uh, this is definitely a fibroblast. Right? This is also definitely a fibroblast, right? Normally, a fibroblast will form collagen, right? If you look at this fibroblast, perfect. Can I say whatever fibroblast is circled is not extremely flat, is a bit, bit plump, the nucleus. Generally, a fibroblast nucleus would be very thin like this. You must have seen a fibroblast, dermal tissue of fibroblast. You will not appreciate the nucleus at all, right? It's definitely a little bit plumper. It's not just plump, like Adil rightly pointed out. Can you see the pink cytoplasm? The cytoplasm is a bit abundant, especially in this cell. Look at them. They are plump, they have an abundant and they have a pink cytoplasm. Right? So this is how a myofibroblast looks. Right? So this is a very, very important finding for me to come to a diagnosis. Because when I see myofibroblasts, can I call them like kind of a uh, reactive condition? I do have something called some myofibroblastomas and myofibroblastic lesions, but in general, when I see myofibroblast, can I call them a healing tissue? Is it possible for me to come it as a healing tissue? Because in general, a normal looking myofibroblast will be seen in healing condition, right? A normal scar will have myofibroblast. So it could be a normal scar tissue. I'm not, I'm not sure. Let's see what it is. Right? Next. Ante, you did comment on mitotic figure. What's your take on this? And what's your take on others on this? I have a cell. Can I call this a mitotic figure? Is it right to call it a mitotic figure? Yes, possible, no. That's a mitotic figure, right? So when you look at this mitotic figure, is it a typical mitotic figure or an atypical mitotic figure? Because atypical is anything which is not bipolar is a mitotic figure, right? That's a mitotic figure. That's actually a very, very typical mitotic figure. It's not started to separate yet. It's just in the metaphase rest, right? It's looking like this, where all the chromosomes are arranged in metaphase. And then it's a mitotic figure. Uh, the way to pick up mitotic figure is, if you look, I'll zoom a little bit. Let's see if it's, if you can appreciate them or not. 
I'm having a nucleus to the side of this, right? In this cell, can you see the nucleus being well defined? The cell which is next to it. Can you see kind of a nuclear membrane and a very defined nucleus? Can you see them? Appreciate them? Yes. The same with this, the same with this, the same with this. But when you look at the cell which has been circled, are you able to appreciate a nuclear membrane or is it frizzy? It's not proper, right? It's kind of frizzled outside, right? I cannot appreciate a nuclear membrane. When you do not appreciate a nuclear membrane in any nucleus, I'm going to think of a mitotic figure because that's the first defining criteria to call it as mitotic figure, right? It's a very frizzled out nuclear membrane because once the nuclear membrane is lost, the cell is in mitosis. Because if you remember your school days, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and uh, till, uh, your uh, different phase of mitosis, that's when my, when my nuclear membrane is lost, it can then separate and it can go to the corners, right? This is definitely a mitotic figure. It's undoubtedly a typical mitotic figure. Though it is not yet separated, it's not looking weird, right? It's looking bland still, a typical mitotic figure, right? So these are the only uh, options I have. These are the only three images. Now comment on a diagnosis. It's a 12 year old kit, tibial lesion. I'll just sum up whatever we've seen. I'm having two types of areas. One is an osteoblastic area. One is a fibroblast predominant area. The osteoblastic area has a little bit of fibroblastic proliferation, but a very benign appearing, benign looking, benign typically. And the fibroblastic area have lots of myofibroblast. The cell is having reactive normal mitotic figures. So it's a proliferative lesion, right? So tell me now the differential diagnosis. Can we go to our initial clinical differential diagnosis? We'll see whether will it fit into it. Is this osteosarcoma? And yes or no, that's all. Can it be an osteosarcoma? It's unlikely to be an osteosarcoma, right? It's not an osteosarcoma. It is not an Ewing sarcoma. It's not an endosomal bone cyst, neither a fibrocortical defect. Fibrocortical defect is non ossifying fibroma. I'm having lots of ossifications here. It's neither an ossifying fibroma, right? These are all whatever we had in mind is not the perfect match here, right? It's not a fibrous dysplasia. It's not a metastasis, right? Now, I'm just going to give you a thought. Tell whether it, it can be ossifying fibroma or not. Again, I'm just asking you to more questions so that you can answer and you can become better. That's all. Can it be an ossifying fibroma or not? If not, you have to tell me what is differing in this image, which is not such as to open ossifying fibroma. Hello, Jessa. Why it is not an ossifying fibroma? It can be an ossifying fibroma. Okay, anyone else wants to would do you have a difference of opinion from whatever Sujana said? She says it can be an ossifying fibroma still. Yeah, she goes also gone with yes. Okay, fine. It's an ossifying fibroma. In an ossifying fibroma. The spindle shaped cell should be fibroblast or myofibroblast. I have a simple terminology. I'm going to just extrapolate the terminology. An ossifying fibroma should have fibroblast predominantly, right? And yes, a little bit of myofibroblast as well. But here I am not seeing fibroblast. Whatever cells I am seeing here are plump with extra eosinophilic things. So it's more of myofibroblast, not a fibroblast. So I'm Putting ossifying fibroma a little bit lower down the differential diagnosis, it will be pure fibroblast. If you have seen a fibroma or a fibrosarcoma, such blue thinned out cell, that's how an ossifying fibroma will be. If you look at this low power image, it's not blue. It's not blue, it's more pinkish and a little bit of blue color, which means it cannot be an ossifying fibroma. They are low power diagnosis. If with the color, you can easily come to a conclusion, right? So here, let me kind of uh, clear this field and see. I'm just going to give you one possibility. You tell me whether it's possible or not. That's all. When I look at this image, I want you to comment on the transition. You have a fibroblastic area. You have an area with osteoblast and fibroblast. You have an area which is purely osteoblastic. Right? Have you heard of something called as zonation? Have you heard of anything called as zonation? If so, where have we heard them? I'm sure you must have heard about zonation in a bone lesion. Where have we heard them? You must have heard. 
a bone lesion with zonation myofibrillus react to mitotic figures. Okay. Okay, can I call this zonation? I am transferring from perfect deshmuk. Transferring from a fibroblastic area to a myofibroblastic area. Right. Can this be myositis also? We can like deshmuk said. Nodular fasciitis also I can have it. But nodular fasciitis uh, still will you have bony tissue, bony reactive bone formation there in nodular fasciitis? It's a fasciitis, right? Actually, you won't have that. We have a different pattern of zonation in nodular fasciitis, but not a bone formation there. It's unlikely to be nodular fasciitis, fine. It's more fitting into myositis ossificans, fine. This was a case of myositis ossificans. It was very simple for us because I had a pre-operative diagnosis of myositis ossificans, right? Uh, in general, you will have a difficulty when in, especially in bone and soft tissue, if you don't have a good radiologist. If you don't have a good radiologist, the entire thing is going to be difficult. But if you have a very good radiologist, they can pinpoint and give you what they're thinking in your imaging. Your job will be just to confirm. If it is not looking like that, go and sit back in the tumor board and see what it is. Fine. The simple case of myositis resources. The purpose of putting this here is when you have any biopsy, don't always think it's cancer or some benign lesions. There is n number of non neoplastic conditions there. Right? The n number of non neoplastic conditions there. So do keep them in mind as well, right? So these are few words of our myositis ossificans. There are different things, early lesions where I can have more sheets of plum, myofibroblast like spindle shape cells. Uh, Satvik uh, for the plus causes, uh, that's all is it, uh, with, we are done with the TND. We will keep more uh, MCQ sessions maybe. Uh, it will not, it'll not be the course of TND, a random uh, mixed bad discussions, fine. Okay, cellular and fibrocartilage area may be present. Mitotic figures actually should be more brisk than what I found. The lesion, the reason why I was searching for mitotic figure and it was not so much florid is it's not an early lesion, it's a late lesion because you saw more mature and an organized bone, which means it's going towards a settled phase. Only when they are very active in the early myofibroblastic like area, you will have more readily available mitotic figures. Zoning is perfectly a classical finding in myositis ossificans. Do not forget them. And they should not, there should be never be necrosis, right? When I see a necrosis, I'm going to think of something else. I miss something. I'm going to rewatch and come to a diagnosis, right? Okay, there's a simple case of myositis ossificans. Okay, this should have been the case one. I've changed it. Okay. We'll go to one more case. Let's see if we can learn something new from this case. It's a biopsy from an, let's say, 40 year old person. Cervical mass. 40 year old person cervix. There are again three images. I'm going to display all the three images. Uh, I want you guys to comment. Everyone who is seeing, just comment on whatever you see and then let's come to a diagnosis. Okay. Generally, cervical issues are easy. Let's see if you can pick this up. Comment on the biopsy. I'm going to keep mute till you guys are going to comment. Whatever, even if you say you're not able to understand, it's completely fine. But do comment something on the biopsy. Anything? Stoma, right? Okay, fine. Stoma and glands. That's more than a function general. Gland to stoma ratio is increased. Great. Any other observation made? So I take both of your comments. It's a cervical biopsy. So tell me one. Increased glands, gland-like pattern. Great. I just only want only one comment and the easiest comment of all. Do you think this is an exocervical lesion or an endocervical lesion? whatever Deshmukh was about to say. It is an endocervical lesion, right? Could be forming. I'll come to it. It's an endocervical lesion to find it. And you have a complex architecture. Uh, could be forming. I hope you must have commented this part as could be forming. I think so, Adil. It's an endocervical lesion, right? Okay, great. I'll show you more images. Tell me if you can come to a diagnosis. Definitely an endocervical lesion. Perfect. 
comment on this image again i want you to look at everything keep your differential diagnosis maybe more focused on endocervical lesions then we'll come to the answer comment on this image it's a high power of the same biopsy that that was the size of the biopsy what do you think anything which crosses your mind no you guys started well i just want you to add to it uh cervical polyp fine nucleus is enlarged okay atpia great fine just open up you might be right you might be wrong it doesn't matter at all if you feel you are a bit hesitant you can delete the comment also i don't care about it but do comment back to back glance but nuclear gland is not very much abnormal right okay not much of pleomorphism. pleomorphism is present fine let's go to a little bit more higher power to verify all your findings takdeep has said that there's nuclear size enlargement a few papillary appearances okay there's a little bit of pleomorphism a little bit of pdpia but you are not still a bit dicey right comment on this i am sure that this is a uh, good enough image for you to comment on the nuclear architecture uh deepishika deepishika areas of hemorrhage as of now we know that's a procedural hemorrhage fine so this image is particularly for commenting the nuclear architecture i don't want anything else comment on the nucleus place a stratification okay that's a good approach because when you have endocervical and endometrial glands, one of the important things I look for is stratification. Good. Anything else? Okay. Yes, some of you commented ATPA, pleomorphism, nuclear size enlargement. Is that there or I can ignore it? Hill pleomorphism. Lightly enlarged nuclear. Okay, great. Anyone wants to want to add? Pleomorphism is present. Fine, great. Okay, now let's take your mild pleomorphism. See, because the term mild and slight are a little bit very, uh, like it's more subjective. For me, something might be mild, which might, which might be completely normal for you, right? So instead of using those subjective terminologies, whenever you approach anything, when you call it dysplastic, I want you to make sure normal structures are not seen. Can I say the first evidence of dysplasia will be loss of the normal structure, normal appearance or the normal function? Yes, that should be the first appearance for me, right? It's an endocervical gland. It's always it an endocervical lesion, right? When it's an endocervical lesion, what do you think is the normal function of endocervical glands? What do you think is the normal function of any endocervical gland? You want to say no normal abnormality is definitely easy. Can I say the normal function is to secrete mucin? It's mucin secretion, right? Perfect. This is a very good hyper image. Tell me whether mucin secretion here is retained or lost. It's 100% retained, right? If you can look, almost every nucleus, almost everywhere, starting from here, almost everywhere I'm having the mucin secretion. The subnuclear mucin secretion is very, very prominent, right? Perfect. That's enough for me. So when you say a mucin secretion is retained, let's assume that in a uh, colonic tumor, in a colonic cancer, when you are discussing about your uh, ulcerative colitis or your gastric adenomas when you want to call it low grade or an high grade dysplasia have you read that a loss of mucin is one of the first features of dysplasia you must have read that especially with inflammatory bowel diseases because that's where i am i always contemplate with low grade and high grade dysplasia right so when i have a retained mucin secretion do you still want to call it dysplastic or not
right? So that's very important. Again, basics are extremely important, and Robbins is enough for you to uh, go with basics, fine. Uh, Jasa, this is for postgraduates. Are you a postgraduate? If not, definitely we'll have something later for undergraduates where we can interpret it very easily. If you're a postgraduate, the first thing for a postgraduate is complete the normal things. You must have had Beter's histopathology or Stacey Mills histology for pathologist. Start with that. Once you know normal, abnormality is a piece of cake, fine? Great. So most of you now are aligned with the term. It's not dysplastic. The reason is evidence or the reason is because I told you there's no dysplasia. If it's because you changed your opinion because I told, please reconsider that. If you feel that it's not dysplastic based on the mucin secretion, mucin presence retained, then it's completely fine, right? Uh, Adil told about a little bit of pleo, uh, stratification. This part, right? This is the place I can at least feel uh, this more stratified. When you look at every stratification, can I say that in this part, the gland epithelium is kind of shrunken? It's not proper, right? It's fine, Satwik. It's not proper, it's not flat. So when you don't have a flat epithelium, do not comment on stratification there, right? Please don't comment on stratification there. I, if you are commenting on stratification, comment on something which is extremely uniform. Only for areas which is extremely uniform, comment on stratification. This is very, very important, especially when you comment on stratification on ovarian cystic lesions, right? Where it's convoluted, it will look stratified. That's an artifactual stratification. When it's linear, comment on that area, if it is really stratified, I'll have the appearance, right? Again, here, it might be a little bit stratified, but yes, here I do have stratification, little bit stratification is there, right? That one did have stratification. And what have you commented on cribriform architecture, the first image, uh, Adil? Yes, this is kind of little bit darker. I do accept it's a little bit darker, but even in those areas, can I say mucin secretion is retained? I do see good amount of mucin. Even my nuclear is a bit more darker, Definitely retained, fine. Just uh, for every need PG aspirant over here, uh, you need not be an expert in histopathology. You're not a pathologist. And one thing I want you to be an expert is history. When you look at a history of a person who is having a chronic GRD, you think of Barrett's esophagus. The microscopy should have one and only will be Barrett's esophagus, right? So do not look at the image first. Look at the history, try to solve the question, and look at the image and complement that solve, fine. Now let's get back to this. I do a little bit of mucin secretion retain still, right? Okay. Now I'm having a glandular lesion. My only question to you guys is this is always a pressing thing for me. Is it malignant or benign? That's more than enough for me. Is it malignant or benign? Unanimously, we'll come to an agreement whether it's malignant or benign. If you can reach that, that will be great. Malignant or benign? Benign. Great. Anyone else has a difference of opinion? Malignant or benign? Benign. It's fine. See? When you are going to report, it's completely fine if you do not, if you are not able to subcategorize benign. But when you look at the microscopy, you should be very clear on it's malignant or benign. That's enough. After that, you can open the textbook and look at the benign lesions of cervix and you can subclassify and come to a diagnosis easily, fine. This was a classical case of microglandular adenosis or microglandular hyperplasia, fine. This is one of the often misdiagnosed entity on a small biopsy. So whenever you see glands which are crowded, because that's first thing which all of you guys noticed, most of you said that crowded glands, very less stroma, high clamp to stroma ratio, all of them you incline towards a diagnosis of a cancer. Don't keep that always. Keep in mind that you can have hyperplastic lesions in cervix as well. Right? Because when you see the same crowding in endometrium, automatically your brain goes and thinks whether it's a low grade dysplasia or high grade dysplasia. Here I don't think about that. Dysplastic crowded glands, we call it an endocervical adenocarcinoma, right? So this is a classical case of a microglandular hyperplasia. MJ stands for that. The exact points from WHO, they will have extremely closely black grass. Sometimes it will be extremely difficult and impossible to differentiate from an uh, endocervical adenocarcinoma. Right? The most important thing here is this. This is what we saw almost all through the biopsy. Right? 
I love mucin cells, vacuoles, and which is often subnuclear. You might even have signal to appearance. Keep this in mind. If you have a habit of writing notes or sticking something above your uh, reporting table, put it there. I'll come to it, Deshmukh. Right? So this is very very important for me. That a nuclei will be small, irregular, and mitotic nucleus will be low. Regular mitotic nucleus will be low. We didn't have much of pleomorphism. If you look, it's decent. It's it's not hyperchromatic at all, right? And sometimes you can have an associated reserve cell hyperplasia if you have the biopsy kind of moving towards a little bit toward ex exosomics as well, right? Okay. This book, adenofibroma. I'll go back to the image again. This was the entire biopsy. Do we have an equal amount of the stromal proliferation here compared to the adeno component? I don't, right? It's predominantly in glandular component. And even when you look at the stromal component, can you call them and write them off as normal cervical stroma or an hyperplastic cervical stroma? I'll show you in just a second. It's a normal cervical stroma, right? The stroma is loose. I do have spindle shaped cells. I do have a good amount of good amount of tiny, tiny uh, vessels, right? Even if you look at this, these are all capillaries, right? When you have an adenofibroma, will you have capillaries? Or the stroma since it's hyperplastic i need to have well-formed arteries i need to have thick well-formed vessels right so those are pointers for me to say that it is only a glandular proliferating lesion and not a gland plus a stromal proliferating lesion whenever there's a stromal hyperplasia one it will become compact it will not become uh it will not be looking ugly looking it will become compact if there's a stromal hyperplasia you must have seen lots of cases of fibroadenoma or in your leomyoma it will look like that the stroma if it looks compact, think of stromal proliferation also. Second, in every stroma, when it becomes compact, the vessels will change to thick wall capil vessels. It will not be capillaries anymore. In a normal stroma, you will always have capillaries only. Keep that in mind. Right? Okay. Let's go to the thing. Sometimes, where I, you will still have a problem with microglial hyperplasia is when it's extremely florid. And that is a difficult case even for the best of the best people. When it's solid or trabecular, when it becomes extremely solid, it will be now at least I had a little bit of stroma in between. When you don't have stroma in between, it will be very difficult for you to push towards a hyperplastic or a benign condition. That time, if you still have trouble, you can use markers. But please don't use markers always for every case. When you have a clear nuclear feature, which is pleomorphic, atypical mitosis, hyperchromasia stratification call it cancer if it is back to back if it is solid and still the nucleus looks benign where you have a differential diagnosis of florid mgh versus an adenocasma then use markers you are the best judgment of when you want to use markers if you feel you are uncomfortable in reporting only with an uh, hne please ask for a marker and these are markers as per who er and cyclin d will be positive the proliferating lesion so definitely cyclin d will be positive what is more important for me is this Wymantin CA P16 negative. When I use these three markers, can I say if it is endocervical or endometrial adenocasma that will help me differentiate from a uh, microglandular adenosis? It will definitely help, right? Microglandular hyperplasia will definitely help. Because P16 CA will be positive generally in endocervical adenocasma, Wymantin will be positive in your endometrial adenocasma, right? So this, the second panel of marker will definitely help me to differentiate MGH from an adenocasma. Again, this only if you're extremely at doubt. Yeah, as I said, it's a very low proliferating risk. It will be low only. This is just for namesake, for theoretical purpose. It is extremely helpful if you have it out. Right? Again, we had one more. This lesion has no malignant potential. The second lesion, what we saw, the first was myositis ossificus. Second was microglial hyperplasia. Both of them are benign the mix of malignant lesions. I overlook i might upgrade the lesion and call them malignant so please keep an eye on it fine just one more case it's a very simple case uh comment on this gestational trophoblastic disease Shujana. p16 is a surrogate marker for hpv so gestational trophoblastic disease are generally p63 positive Okay, 38 year old person, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Comment on whatever comes to your mind.
I want you guys to come in. This is a very simple diagnosis. I'm sure you can diagnose them. In the previous case, Devshika. I'll go back to it after discussing this. There's no pleomorphism in the previous case, but still, we'll definitely go back and have a look. You want to comment on anything in this image? It's a low power image. No one wants to take a bit. Okay, let's go to higher power. Leo Mayama. Okay, great. And higher power it is in uh, curating. Comment on it. Any comment on this image? I dream fellows, Leo Moyama again. Anyone else wants to add to it? No? Okay, one more image. The classical face, you must have seen this, you must have reported it as well. More blue looking, good. Anyone wants to add to it? No comments still. Rosets. Vijana is an endo uh, cervical curating, right? Do you know any condition with endo cervical curating with rosets? Uh, yeah, Shika as well. Do you know any endo cervical lesion with, uh, sorry, endometrial curating with rosets? Unlikely, right? But can I call, these are things which you, you thought of rosets, right? I hope these are things which you thought of rosets. Uh, can this be glands? Is it possible for them to be endometrial glands and just a thought process? Can it be glands? It can be glands, right? Was the more bluish appearance look thought made you think of any uh, undifferentiated human rosset? It's, it can be glands, right? Looks more like a stromulation, right? We'll go back here. We'll go back a little bit. Uh, one more finding. Tell me, what is this? If you pick this up, uh, that's my end of my diagnosis. I have all the classical findings here. What are these three? What have I marked? All of them are classical findings in the diagnosis. This is a very, very common diagnosis. I'm sure I must have seen them. Stromal nodule. I'll come to Deshmukh. I think I gave you a bit of hype in the first two cases. And the third case was very simple. It's a bit difficult for you. Okay, what are these? What are these two structures? Just name the, these two structures. Deshmukh, I'm going to take your... Uh, I'll go to it 2x. Just give me a second. I'll take your last case comment. And I want you to apply that in this case. And see whether it will fit inside. Adenomyosis is a bit difficult to pick it up on acute ratings, right? Isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Let me go to the low power. This is the low power image, uh, high dream fellows. The only low power I have. First and the form of vessels, right? Great. Vedanti said that the last one was vessels. Yes, that's a blood vessel. Great. It is more of a uh, thick wall vessels compared to a capillary, right? So first thing, first and foremost thing, can I call this a polyp? First query is, can I call this a polyp? kind of looks like a polyp it's more of a rounded lesion though i am not able to appreciate the epithelium on all three uh, sides that's a, def a definition of that i do have endometrial glands i have a polypod architecture and the classical appearance for polyp is the fibrostroma right if you have read an endometrial polyp theory anytime fibrostroma glands interspersed thick wall blood vessels these are the three classical diagnostic signs of any endometrial polyp. Do remember them, right? I want you to remember these always. Thick wall blood vessels is one. 
And you have lots of thick-walled blood vessels here, quite a few of them. Can I call this also a blood vessel? It's definitely a blood vessel, right? So you have three blood vessels adjacent to each other and lots of thick-walled blood vessels. And like you guys said, uh, uh, some of you commented on an endometrial stromal nodule. Generally, an endometrial stromal nodule will not have interspersed uh, glands like this and might not have a thick wall blood vessel right those are two points against the endometrial stromal nodule but again if you still have a doubt go for a marker and see if it's an endometrial stromal nodule or not the simple case of an adenom endometrial adenomyomatous polyp that's all the simple polyp of the endometrium it's nothing big again as i said that two things were out of box the third one became easy since so you're trying to over diagnose things that's all right it's a simple adenomatous polyp i'm not going to have discuss much about adenomatous polyp the only thing which i want you to discuss and i want you want every pathologist to know is something about hormonal effects See, these are extremely common in day-to-day -day life right uh, have you given out any diagnosis uh, during your residency or during your uh, senior residency or jrship something as pill endometrium have you called something as pill endometrium you must have right pill endometrium is something which is routinely used day in and day out so for me calling something a spill endometrium is very very a non-specific diagnosis then i can say that this is estrogen related when i can say this is progestin related when i can call something as tamoxifen related i wanted to use very specific term rather than calling pill endometrium when i say pill it can be any pill if you specify it and if you kind of correlate this history as well once you will feel good. It's a feel-good diagnosis, that's all. There are lots of hormonal effects. I'm going to show you a series of seven, eight images. Keep this in mind. I'll share the PDF with you guys in the Telegram group as well. So that you can hold them, you can take a printout, put it in your desk. Whenever you see endometriums, look for these findings and specify what is the change there, right? The first thing, when it's an estrogen only endometrium, when I'm going to have only estrogen effects, one, there's going to be persistent proliferative endometrium. I'll have a good amount of proliferation due to unopposed estrogen effect, and there'll be a secondary breakdown. The stroma will break down. You'll have stromal balls. What do I call as stromal balls? Is they are tiny, tiny aggregates of stroma like this. I have tiny aggregates of stroma here. You can see them here, right? You can see them here. Small blue aggregates of stroma. That's called as stromal balls. Uh, if you have time, go for Blostein. Blostein is a very, very good uh, book to appreciate the normal morphology of the endometrium. Just have a look, quick look at that, right? There are lots of stromal balls, aggregates of stroma, and have very dilated glands, and lots of them are in the proliferative phase. That's your cystically dilated gland with stromal breakdown. Second finding for estrogen is the proliferative glands with fibrin thrombi. Classical fibrin thrombi with the glands, right? When you have fibrin thrombi, and if the patient is not in the menstrual phase, that's a classical finding suggest of estrogen unopposed estrogen effect when you see these two findings which is persistently proliferating endometrium i am not commenting on the endometrium glands because i'm sure you know how to call it a proliferative phase stromal breakdown with fibrin thrombi think of estrogen only effect ask for the clinician uh, what the patient is having suffering from if it's hyperestrogenism comment on estrogen only effect or unopposed estrogen effect on endometrium that's enough if it's progestin only, I can have very classical findings. You know about progestin. Whenever progesterone comes into place, endometrial glands will stop proliferating and they'll start secreting. When I have more amount of progesterone in the form of pills or any abnormality, let it be pregnancy also, it will become decidualized. That's very, very important, right? Short term progesterone will have secretory effects. That's more of the pink secretion inside the glands. A long term progesterone will have decidualization, right? What do you mean by decidualization? It's a very classical finding most of you must have learnt in your initial phase of your postings. What is decidualization? When do you call it decidualized? When will you call anything decidualized? The stroma, when do you call it decidualized? Okay, the stroma has a little bit of more cytoplasm, pinky cytoplasm. That's called as a decidualization effect of the stroma. Right? It looks like this. I just want you guys to comment on this. What is this? What's the one which is circled? What is the one which is circled there? Perfect. Perfect description, Dandy. 
that's how we call it distribution right this small one is an atrophic gland it's definitely an atrophic gland right it's not proliferating it's single line there's no cytoplasm at all this is definitely an atrophic gland it's an atrophic gland when i have atrophic gland which means progesterone is predominant not allowing the gland it's a long term progesterone effect not a short term the short term i'll have secretion there right plus i have lots of distillation changes in your stoma okay like smithan they said that i have cells with an abundant eosinophilic flick cytoplasm it look kind of looks like a stoma uh, squamous cell what is distillation atrophic glands distillate stroma think of a long term progesterone effect a short term effect as i said it will have more of secretory effects like your secretory phase of endometrium right next the combined effects of both estrogen and progesterone again it's, it's a classical finding where you see uh, it's totally depend on the biopsy time and duration if it's due, especially during ho hormone repression therapy when i have both the combined effects if you take the biopsy during the estrogen predominant phase of the hrt i'll have the uh, findings of unopposed estrogen when i take during progesterone predominant phase i'll have the findings of that of progesterone right so we'll ignore that for now because we know the estrogen and progesterone as well uh, look at that PRMs, progesterone receptor modulators, because these drugs are being increasingly used. Your tamoxifen PRMs are being increasingly used, so you will have endometrial biopsies there because most of these drugs alter the endometrial cycle, might result in menorrhagia, and even some of them are risk factor for endometrial hyperplasia as well as carcinomas. They'll keep having biopsies of endometrial curatings, people who are on long term therapy for modulators, right? asymmetrical stromal and epithelial growth which means my stroma and the gland is not in synchrony which might look like your uh, f disorder proliferative endometrium exactly like that dilated both mitotic as well as secretory effects again it's not perfectly fitting prms will have that way to differentiate this from an disordered proliferative endometrium is chicken wire capillaries when i have a disorder proliferative endometrium with the history of any drug intake, look for capillaries. These are chicken wire capillaries. They look like chicken. They are tiny, tiny capillaries, right? I'm sure you must have known about chicken wire calcification and capillaries. It's this is your chicken wire. So they have right, multiple tiny capillaries, very, very close together, like plexiform capillary. That's one of the classical findings in progesterone receptor modulators, right? And the glandular complexity as well. One finding for your tamoxifen related. This will be classical for any person who's on tamoxifen related, which is in hyperplasia, which is stack on appearance of glands. The most important thing is very glandular stromal condensation. It will exactly look the same. Again, this is from Blostin. This is not my case. The stack on appearance of the glands. And though it's a low power, you can see that in this part alone, it's a bit darker compared to this part. This part. Again, when I come close to the gland, when I come close to the gland, the stroma is a little bit more condensed than a little bit surrounding the gland, right? A stag on appearance of calculi, sorry, stag on appearance of the glands and a periglandular stromal condensation, the classical findings in your tamoxifen related effects, right? So these are four things they want you to remember. Unopposed estrogen, progesterone predominant, progesterone receptor modulators, and your tamoxifen. There are some things, if you kind of report it more systematically, rather than using an umbrella term of pill endometrium, uh, one advantage for me is that the gynecologist will be having more trust on me because I know what I'm looking at. When I can pick up hormonal changes in a biopsy, I can definitely pick up malignancies. That's the statement you're going to make if you report what you're supposed to report, right? And Blaston is an extremely good book. If you're in a PG and if you have time, please go ahead and read it. If you're post PG, you'll definitely have time and please read it. We have seen three cases today, one of myositis ossificans, one was your uh, microglandular hyperplasia of the cervix, the third one is a simple endometrium, endometrial polyp, fine. Do you guys have any doubts? If you don't have one, can we call it a day? I'll try to cover more for postgraduates. I hope I'll be able to do that. No doubts. I said I'll uh, think I'll be able to share the PDF with you guys. I'll share the PDF with you guys. 
So if there are no other doubts, we can call it a day. Uh, have a nice night. I'll share the PDF in your uh, In the telegram will fine thank you for your time see you bye bye i uh, definitely i will I'll, I'll do my best i'm trying to gather my time i hope i'll be a little bit free from august i'll concentrate more on postgraduates fine okay. thank you for your time bye 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 everyone take care good night